Before we get stuck in, I just want to give a quick thank you shout out to my mutt tier Patreons. We have Glad Goku, Dare Denny, Kale Bennett, That Jordo, Ken K of Warheads, Super Hyper Mecha SP Mark II, Cirrus the Skeptic, and New Year, New Pair of Underpants. That's right, I change them yearly. Thank you. Hi, what's up? I'm Channel Pup, the mascot for the level-headed fanboy. Welcome back to another installment of the Spider-Man Retrospective series. This time we're going to be looking at what could well be considered the first good official Spider-Man adaptations. These are the Spider-Man cartoons of the 1980s. There's a lot to enjoy about the adaptations that came before, don't get me wrong. I really enjoyed watching and discussing all of the Spider-Man adaptations that we've discussed so far in this series, especially the Japanese one, just for how utterly bonkers it is. But these shows either barely scratched the surface of what a Spider-Man story had to offer, or just went in a completely different direction entirely. In terms of being a faithful adaptation, the shows we're going to discuss in today's video are a notable step up. But first, if you love Spider-Man, don't just take my word for it when I say that this channel is the place to be. Check out the rest of my channel and subscribe for a smorgasbord of Spidey content. This is just one chapter of an ongoing Spidey retrospective series. Previously, we discussed Toei's Japanese Spider-Man series, so there's a lot to check out. And I'm also working on my very own adaptation of Spider-Man for a non-profit, zero-budget fan film. So for behind-the-scenes updates and more, be sure to check out the Patreon. The link is in the description below and your support is hugely appreciated. So today we are headed back into pop culture's favorite era, the 1980s, to discuss a couple of Spider-Man cartoon series that were running parallel to each other, both from the same studio, although they do have a different lead actor, so they're not rivaling the Dick Sonic cartoons in that particular respect. One of these shows is a cult classic, and the other is a bit more of a head-scratcher. But let's start at the beginning. Before Marvel Studios, there was Marvel Productions. Originally founded by animation legend most known for the Pink Panther, Frizz Freeling, DFE Films, which stood for Depati Freeling Enterprises, would be sold to Marvel Comics in 1981, with Freeling departing the company to work for Warner Brothers once again. Prior to the shift at Marvel Productions, DFE did produce two Marvel shows, The New Fantastic Four in 1978 and Spider-Woman in 1979, where Spider-Man would make appearances ahead of his own show, which would kick off the slate of Marvel Productions shows, all while still continuing the ongoing works of DFE. So yes, Marvel's Pink Panther is indeed a thing that actually exists. And in 1981, we would be graced with the very simply titled Spider-Man. And it's everything you'd expect. There's not really much to talk about here, so I'm going to be comparing it to the Spider-Man of 1967 quite a bit, with that being the previous animated Spidey show. It is, notably, a step up from that particular show in pretty much every respect. 1967 Spider-Man at its best offered retellings of iconic Spidey stories from the comics, simplified to the point of redundancy, with the more relatable drama angle of Peter's life being pretty much neglected. It was pretty much divided into the Spidey antics and the Bugle antics. You'd rarely see Aunt May or any love interest aside from the sort of will-they-won't-they they between Peter and Betty. These elements did start to creep in just a little in Season 2, but again, very simplified. I wouldn't exactly call Spider-Man 1981 all-in as far as adapting these many faucets of Peter Parker's life, but it does at least focus a lot more on the work-life balance struggles of Peter Parker. Maybe he's got a paper he needs to write. Maybe he's competing with a rival photographer at the Bugle. Maybe he's got a date and he's forced out of all of these things that he'd otherwise prioritize to go and thwart the latest crackpot plans of the villain of the week. It's still as formulaic as it'll get out, but it is doing a significantly better job at involving more of Peter Parker beyond just his job at the Daily Bugle. 
It's still laser focused on Peter and Spidey though, so don't expect stories featuring say Harry Osborn or Gwen Stacy or Mary Jane, they are nowhere to be found. Despite them being firmly established characters at this stage as far as Spidey history goes. And unlike the later seasons of the 1967 Spider-Man series, we are back to mostly classic Marvel villains for this particular show. There's a few originals such as the Gadgeteer and a unique version of Sidewinder, but we're generally back to the major players, your Green Goblins, your Doc Ox and the like, and for a great example of how this show treats its villains when compared to the 1967 version, let's quickly discuss the Green Goblin. Granted, he doesn't appear much in this show, but he's nowhere near as simplified as the almost literal goblin we had in 1967. Always trying to steal magic books and learn spells, no. This time we touch much more on the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde dynamic of Norman Osborn and the Green Goblin, and his arsenal includes less magic, more gadgets and serums. Goblin even knows Peter Parker's secret identity in episode 10, Revenge of the Green Goblin. Of course he loses his memory by the end, but this is at least something, right? There's a history between the two suggested this time. Unlike his comics counterpart at the time as well, this show would suggest that Norman Osborn transforms into the Green Goblin physically rather than it just being a disguise, so the show was pretty ahead of its time in that respect, as this is how the Green Goblin's alter ego worked in the Ultimate comics all the way in the early 2000s. Of course, on the other hand, you've got, for example, the Lizard, who this time is just a moustache twirling lizard. He's never at any point referred to as Dr. Connors, nor is it ever suggested that he has any kind of alter ego. He's just a lizard, and that's all she wrote. Which if anything is even more of a simplification than 1967's take on the character, with Dr. Connors having both of his arms. So when it comes to Lizard, this one's actually kind of a downgrade from 1967, how does that happen? This show would also mark the first appearance of Black Cat outside of the comics, who serves as the villain of the episode, Curiosity Killed the Spider-Man, in which she attempts to steal the Maltese mouse, while no real romance between her and Spidey is ever suggested this time. And of course, given that he's my favourite comic book villain, we need to talk about Mysterio, who features in the episode The Pied Piper of New York Town, where he opens a nightclub playing his very own special music to hypnotise New Yorkers into doing his bidding. Not too dissimilar to dancing murder rock fearful hit tune from the Japanese TV series where Professor Monster built cyborg duplicates of a popular band to perform a version of their song, The Spider-Man Boogie, in a bid to lure out Takuya Yamashiro and uncover his secret identity. See, this sounds cool, doesn't it? Check out my video on the Japanese Spider-Man series, it's a crazy safari. Hypnosis is no foreign concept to Mysterio, so it's all very in line with his character, but I love that each appearance of these villains suggests some form of history between them and Spidey. Then of course, there's the greatest villain of them all, Spider-Man's one true arch nemesis, Doctor Doom. Which may strike you as a little strange given that Doctor Doom is really more of a Fantastic Four villain, but it wasn't unheard of for Spidey to face off against Doctor Doom, as early as The Amazing Spider-Man issue 5 from way back in 1963. But this is a bit of a mismatch as far as an arch nemesis for Spidey goes. Monarch of an Eastern Territory versus the friendly neighborhood New York pizza loving teenage mutant- Wait, hang on. Especially when you've got plenty of more than established Spidey enemies at your disposal. Why would Doctor Doom be the recurring big bad of 1981's Spider-Man? Well, according to his page on the Marvel Animated Universe wiki, simply put, he looks like Darth Vader. That made him sound like Darth Vader. Darth Vader was all the rage at the time. I couldn't really find any citations for this, but it does add up. The Empire Strikes Back releasing a year prior, Doctor Doom's voice clearly channeling Darth Vader in the show. Uh, despite his presence clearly aping the popularity of Darth Vader here though, we are treated to a pretty faithful depiction of Doctor Doom. It's just a very unique choice that dates the show somewhat. And I'd definitely rather see more of Spidey up against his own rogues. However, this show was no stranger to the occasional crossover, most notably in the episode The Capture of Captain America, which of course means that yes, Spider-Man meets none other than Iron Man as he makes his debut in the Marvel Cinematic-
wait, wrong video. There were also numerous references to Superman of all people, interestingly enough, including this very distinct looking fellow getting changed in a phone booth. Clearly not doing a very good job at keeping evil at bay considering everything Spidey's having to get up to. Now of course, with this being the show to follow Spider-Man 1967, we've got to talk about the animation. No, the animation in 1967 Spider-Man was not of its time, it was bad. Constant reuse of the same sets of poses and movements, constant cutting of corners and off-model shots, it was made on the cheap. And that may have been an industry trend at the time, but it was never good by any standard. Spider-Man 1981 is a significant step up from its 1967 predecessor. While it still appears to be a little cheap and stiff, if there were any reused animations, I sure as hell didn't notice. And everything is a lot more on model now, even down to Spider-Man having all of his webs on his costume, as opposed to just the ones on his mask and boots. The art style is very reminiscent of the Ramita Senior era of Spidey, and I gotta say, I do really enjoy the overall look of this show. Yes, it's fairly cheap and cheerful, but it evokes the style of a 1970s Marvel comic. So naturally, someone that likes Marvel comics of the 1970s is going to like this animation style, I'd imagine. Then as for the acting, again, it's all solid. Peter Parker is played by Ted Schwartz, and once again, he doesn't really sound like a teenager as such, but he does at least sound a lot more youthful than Paul Souls' take, which sounded a lot more like that of a detective private eye in his early 40s. Although credit where it's due, Soul's incredibly dry delivery did make Spidey's quips that much funnier. But Ted Schwartz is definitely the more appropriate choice. And then as for the music, it's your standard fare. Orchestral incidental music that very much fits the bill. Quite dated, albeit not as quintessentially swinging 60s as the 60s version, go figure. But there's a bit more synth in there, especially for the main theme, which is it's nothing memorable or noteworthy. It's a far cry from the very catchy version of the theme from the 60s version, but I mean, it ain't bad. So okay, addressing the elephant in the room, why does nobody ever talk about the 1981 Spider-Man TV series? This show has managed to sneak into 1960s Spider-Man memes without anybody even noticing. Heck, I think even the official Marvel Entertainment YouTube channel might have gotten a little confused between the two shows. Despite the fact that unlike the 1967 series, this one actually made its way to Disney+, Plus, this is still one of the more forgotten Spider-Man TV shows. And why is that? Well, I think I've got an answer. And the answer is that it lives in the shadow of the show that preceded it, the show that ran parallel to it, and the show that succeeded it. 1981 Spider-Man is a step up from 1963 Spider-Man, no doubt. It's basically everything that show should have been. It's a simpler take on Spidey, but one that doesn't neglect aspects that make the character great. Its animation is cheap and cheerful, but not distractingly so. It's like Spider-Man 1967 with a much needed shot of dignity, but because of that, it's nowhere near as funny to look back on. It doesn't have being so bad it's good to fall back on. The shithousery of the 1967 Spider-Man is memorable, like it or not, I happen to like it. For better or for worse, how goofy that show is, is one of the contributing factors to what makes it so memorable. And the problem with Spider-Man 1981 is that the show doesn't really do enough to be memorable for quality's sake either. It's just a purely baseline level of good. It does a fine job at presenting the duality of Peter and Spidey. It does a fine job with adapting its villains for the most part. It does a fine job of capturing the John Romita Senior art style. It's all just fine. Inoffensive. Which is why if it is remembered at all, it's remembered as the one that ran alongside Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And even that show isn't considered exactly as memorable as Spider-Man 1967, or say, Spider-Man the Animated Series in 1994. Yo, Coach Brett here interrupting the video for a little bit of movement. What's going on guys? We're gonna do some squats. So stand up from whatever chair or seat that you're sitting in. And what I want you to do is get into a nice square position, making sure that your feet are flat on the ground. You're going to then slowly drop down into the seat until your butt barely touches the seat and then drive straight back up. I want you to do 10 to 20 reps for about two to three sets and you should be good to go. Hey there. 
Coach Brett here with True Capacity, your path to a healthier you. And at True Capacity, we've got programs tailored specifically for you. It's a body weight program that all you need is just your body weight, a little determination. We've got a minimal equipment program where you don't really need anything, just the essentials. And then we also have a full gym access program where really the only thing you need is a gym membership and you're good to go. So let's embark on this journey together and click the link down below for more details. Thanks guys, excited to see you in there. But okay, shoving Spider-Man 1981 aside was Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And right out of the gate, Spider-Man and his amazing friends has a gimmick to call its own. So naturally, it's going to be a bit more distinctive in the history of Spider-Man TV adaptations. Rather than focusing strictly on Spider-Man, he's sharing this show with two additional characters, creating a different dynamic to the other Spidey shows that we've talked about so far. So, why does this show exist? Why have two Spidey shows running simultaneously? One where he's joined by a couple of friends. Super friends, if you will. Well, there's your answer. Super friends. NBC, the network running Marvel shows, wanted their very own Super Friends. Interesting choice to do this with all loner Spidey leading the charge, especially when you factor in that Marvel has no shortage of superhero teams, but it does just go to show that even in 1981, NBC had a solid understanding of just how lucrative Spidey is. So joining Spidey for his adventures in this run would be Iceman of the X-Men and Spidey's old superhero best bud, the Human Torch of the Fantastic Four. However, things didn't quite pan out that way. The Human Torch was off limits to Marvel Productions for this series, however, this isn't the first time the character was embargoed for an animated series, as he didn't appear in 1978's The New Fantastic Four series either, in which he was replaced by a robot called Herbie created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Now, Marvel Animation Insiders stated that the Human Torch was off limits because NBC were afraid he'd compel kids to set themselves on fire. Holy melted flesh, Batman! But according to comic and TV writer Mark Ivanier, in a blog post from 2007, this was not the case, as the real reason for his absence was because Universal Studios held the television rights to the Human Torch, and in 1978 they were developing a TV pilot for a standalone Human Torch series. I have no idea how they intended on making the Human Torch work before the advent of CGI, my guess is that they really would just set a dude on fire. And if you've seen my video on the Nicholas Hammond Spider-Man, you'll know that health and safety in the film and TV industry was a total Wild West in the 1970s. So, would Spidey and Iceman be joined by Herbie the Robot for their answer to Super Friends? Heh, <laughs> no, don't be silly. If you've got Iceman, it only makes sense to go with an opposing element. A fire-themed protagonist. That way, you've got all the elements. Fire, ice, and spiders. One wonders why they didn't pair Spidey up with Ant-Man and Black Widow and call it the Bug Brigade, but you gotta have friends in the title, so I get it. So Marvel Productions tasked John Romita Sr. and Rick Hoberg with creating a new hero to take the place of the Human Torch. And so we enter Angelica Jones, aka Firestar. Or at least I'd, I'd like to enter her, because not gonna lie, she's kinda bad though. Not to be confused with DC Starfire. We are never getting past the Marvel copies DC allegations. I mean, hey there, super friends. Now, don't count her out as a mere Human Torch substitute though, as rather than being able to just flame on and shoot fire at stuff, Firestar is generally more a controller of heat as an element, but the show even went so far as to give her her very own backstory, which involves her joining the X-Men, and this is where she meets Iceman. At this point in their lives though, Spidey, Firestar, and Iceman are all students at Empire State University, and they confide in each other their secret identities, sharing the superhero and home lifestyle, as they all live with Aunt May, who is even chill with Firestar bringing her dog, Ms. Lion, to stay. Once again, mimicking DC's super friends with Wonder Dog. What's funny is how Marvel later retconned Ms. Lion to be a boy in the Pet Avengers and other comics. Well, why is he called Ms. Lion then? <laughs> Guess you could say Marvel editorial were lying about that. Ah. Also, he's Aunt May's dog now. Now, okay, you got two dudes and a chick all living together at Aunt May's. All young adults. Something's going on here, surely. And the answer is yes. 
It has been shown that Firestar does have a flirty sort of relationship with Iceman and uh, has dated him, but she's also shown dating Spidey too, albeit a little less often. Some super friends they turned out to be, but this is no Spider-Man 3 level love triangle filled with tension and conflict. They all seem pretty chill about it. I guess that that's what happens when one of them's an Iceman. So either they're all oblivious and secretive with Firestar being the only one in the know, harlot, or these three are just going at it. No judgment there as long as everyone's happy and consenting. Now, Ms. Lion wasn't the only character this show brought in to leave their mark on Marvel history. If you're familiar with the character of Harley Quinn or the Riddler's iconic bowler hat as a concept, you'll know that TV and film adaptations do have a tendency to influence the comics they're based on, like a nice little loop. And Spider-Man and his amazing friends brought us a new member of the X-Men in Firestar, making her comic book debut in an adaptation of Spider-Man and his amazing friends before making her Marvel 616 debut in Uncanny X-Men 193 in 1985. Since then, she's appeared in a host of comics dating as recently as X-Men 28 published in November of 2023. So the show itself, it's kind of within the same continuity as the 1981 Spider-Man animated series, presumably taking place after the events of that show, as the Spider-Man and his Amazing Friends episode, The Prison Plot, references the Spider-Man 1981 episode, When Magneto Speaks, People Listen. However, it's not without some contradictions. For one, Ted Schwartz does not reprise his role as Spider-Man, with Dan Gilvezen instead stepping into the role, who, once again, doesn't really sound much like a teenager, but does fit the bill as Spider-Man. Certainly sounds more like Peter Parker than he does Miguel O'Hara, that's for sure. I mean, why would you do that? But also contradicting this being a sequel is that Spider-Man allegedly meets Kraven the Hunter for the first time in this show, despite Kraven appearing in the 1981 Spider-Man series. So it's a little messy. However, this was at least probably our earliest instance of a Marvel Cinematic Universe, with Spider-Man 1981, Spider-Man and his amazing friends, and the Incredible Hulk series all taking place within the same world with regular appearances from other major Marvel Universe heroes. Overall, I think the show's okay. It's got a pretty distinctive feel-good atmosphere to it. It is pretty interesting that we had a show that kind of focused on Spidey's difficult superhero work-life balance with Spider-Man 1981, running at the same time as a show where the burden is shared between three people who are all in on each other's secrets. It's a completely different dynamic, but I can understand why Amazing Friends is the one that's most remembered. Both of these shows would go on to be re-edited and redubbed in the Marvel mashup series, but there's no denying that Amazing Friends was the far more influential of the two with its own comic tie-in series, references spanning across decades, going so far as Spider-Man and his amazing friends, featuring in the original Spider-Verse comic run with them all killed in front of Miss Lion. Okay, what the fuck is wrong with you? Also, this fella here appeared in Across the Spider-Verse. And the legacy of this show extends even as far as a more recent TV series, the 2021 show Spidey and His Amazing Friends, with the title of the show paying obvious homage to its 1981 predecessor, despite the team being comprised of Spider-Man, Spin, and Ghost Spider. And I, I just want to quickly get this out of the way, I will not be extensively talking about 2021's Spidey and His Amazing Friends. It's a show for itsy bitsy babies to get them on board with Spidey's adventures at a very, very young age. It is clearly not meant for me. What the hell could I possibly have to say about this show? Oh my god, Green Goblin's not very threatening, is he? Nah, get, get out of here, it's baby stuff. It's a Spidey show appropriate for babies. I'm not gonna go up to some little baby and be like, your Spider-Man is illegitimate. Nah, no, 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 not going there, not gonna do it. What enjoyment could I get out of that? Yeah, I really don't have much to say about Spider-Man 1981 or Spider-Man and his amazing friends. They're okay, but once you've seen a handful of episodes, you've seen all you really need to see. They were, at the time, the most faithful Spidey media outside of the comics and did a pretty satisfactory job at adapting the character and making it exciting for the kiddos watching. The dynamic in Spider-Man and his amazing friends is pretty upbeat and refreshing, but that's all I really got here. 
The most interesting thing about these shows, however, to me, is that one of the writers, and if you've been watching the retrospective up until this point, his name might ring a bell, is Don Glute. That's right, the man behind the very first Spider-Man fan film, no, not Spider-Man Lotus, you dumb motherfucker, which was also the very, very first known adaptation of Spider-Man, would go on to write for Spider-Man 1981 and Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Never underestimate where fan filmmaking can take you. Those elitist film students who tell you you'll get nowhere making fan films and should instead make movies about a pensive dude looking out a window dragging on a cigarette? Fuck them. Fuck them all to death. So those are the Spidey cartoons of the 1980s. Next up, we're going to be talking about Spider-Man the Animated Series of 1994. And I know that that is one that a lot of you have been waiting for, so look forward to it. Well, what do you guys think? Have you seen Spider-Man 1981? Have you seen Spider-Man and his amazing friends? Which of the two shows is your favorite of the two? Uh, what do you think of the shows? Comment below, discuss, and as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to support more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below is the link to my Patreon page, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can get your name in the credits of these videos. With bespoke shoutouts going to the patrons in the $5 or above tier. Their names are Kalex, Richard Rogers, Glad Goku, Dare Denny, SSSO6, Kale Bennett, That Jordo, Ken K of Warheads, Dazzle Fizzle, Super Hyper Mecha SP Mark II, Sirius the Skeptic, New Year, New Pair of Underpants, that's right, I changed them yearly, and Vera Wild. Thank you so much to you folks for your generosity, and to all of you at home, thank you so much for watching, and have a great day.